The most credible version of the mythicist theory is that Christianity began as a Jewish apocalyptic sect who started worshipping a celestial god figure called Jesus, probably during the 1st century BC. Apocalyptic sects believed that God was good and just but not all-powerful and was involved in a heavenly conflict against Satan and his demons. Satan had managed to take over the world, leading to misery and suffering, but God was going to intervene, boot Satan out, punish sinners and reward his people in some kind of utopia. Key to apocalypticism was that this momentous event was going to be in the near future. The mythicist's apocalyptic sect believed Satan had exploited a universal law of justice that God could not change, which was that sin required atonement and that the atonement was death. He managed to introduce sin to earth via Eve, and as a consequence all humans were sinners and had to die. But God spotted a loophole in this rule. While the death had to be proportional to the sins committed, it didn't have to be the sinner themselves who died. Someone else could die for them, but this would only work if the person who died for them had not sinned themselves. Also, a cheap angel wasn't going to be enough to pay for the sins of the whole world, but God had a son, Jesus, who would do. This Jesus developed an anthropomorphised narrative where he was conceived by God and a heavenly woman and born in the spirit realm. Then later he was crucified as a sacrifice for the sins of the earth, resurrected and elevated to a high-ranking position in the heavenly hierarchy. These events occurred in the distant past, and Jesus had been the resurrected ruling Son of God throughout human history. Then, around the year 70, in the turmoil of the Judeo-Roman War, the anthropomorphization process took another step. Mark wrote a gospel which gave Jesus an earthly existence, which he placed in Jerusalem and Galilee 40 years prior. He did this by associating Jesus with earlier figures from the church and attributing to him sayings and deeds circulating in oral tradition and originating from others, plus a good bit of pure invention. Why Mark did this is not clear. It could have been that he was writing an allegory and did not intend for it to be taken literally. Or it could be that the historicization idea was just another step in the process of anthropomorphization that had already started and Mark was simply trying to organise disparate ideas in circulation into a coordinated narrative. Anyway, once he had done this, the idea took off rapidly for two reasons. One is that a personal saviour who had been on earth, lived, suffered and died with us had more appeal than fantastical imaginings about events in outer space. But the more important reason was church governance. The mythicist church had a problem with governance, both within congregations and between them, because of a lack of a clear power structure. Any church member's inspiration was as good as any others, leading to conflicting ideas. The historical Jesus idea gave clear lines of authority, derived from Jesus through those who had known him, those who had known them, etc., the historicist and mythicist factions coexisted for a while, but the historicist hierarchical power structure gave them the edge in gaining new converts and they came to dominate. That power structure also made them particularly sensitive to heresy, which they vigorously opposed. The result was that heretical literature, including mythicist literature, was not transmitted down to our time with a few exceptions that got through the heretical screen, on the one hand because they had the desirable characteristic of being ancient, and on the other they were not obviously heretical because they did not overtly contradict the historicist narrative. The historicist theory, on the other hand, holds that Christianity did not exist in any form before about 30 AD, when a Jewish holy man called Jesus appeared on the scene, hard on the heels of another more prominent holy man called John the Baptizer. Jesus gathered a small following but didn't make enough of an impact to be noticed by historians. He ended up being crucified by the Romans for sedition in the early 30s, and there the matter would have rested except for two events. The first was, for reasons not fully understood, some of his followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead. This belief gave the group a recognisable identity and they continued to proselytise. The second event, also in the 30s, was the conversion to this group of a cantankerous but charismatic holy man called Paul. Over the subsequent two decades, Paul travelled around the Eastern Roman Empire, 
preaching, founding churches and developing the same celestial backstory for Jesus that the mythicists hold was the theology of the first Christians starting decades previously. Both Jesus and Paul were apocalyptic preachers, prophesying the imminent arrival of God's forces on earth to overthrow the powers of evil. By the late 60s this still hadn't happened and many within the church recognised that they were in this for the long haul and ought perhaps to commit the basics of their religion to writing for posterity. Starting with Mark, the evangelists pieced together what they could of the story of Jesus from circulating sources and oral tradition. From this point on, the historicist and mythicist theories are very similar, the only distinction being that the mythicists suppose that the original mythicist Christian church did not suddenly vanish, but limped on for perhaps a century or so before disappearing, as did the Gnostics in the following centuries. That means that the two theories only diverged significantly on church history in the first century. If Revelation is dated to the reign of Nero of 54 to 68 AD, that makes it pre-Mark and its Christology may help us discriminate between these two theories. Paul too was writing in this period and the mythicist theory exists because Paul doesn't say what historicity expects him to say. He makes no reference to earthly deeds or sayings of Jesus. But he does make a handful of infuriatingly non-specific statements about Jesus that can be interpreted either way. Paul met James, the Lord's brother, but he used sibling relationships overwhelmingly to describe church members as brothers in Christ rather than biological siblings. He says in Galatians that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, which again sounds earthly but he uses a Greek word for born that could mean created in heaven. So now turning to Revelation, I rather agree with Zwingli that it should not have been included in the Bible. It has been no stranger to controversy throughout its history. It had many detractors in the early Christian church. It was included in the New Testament, but was among the last book to be agreed on, and has gone on causing trouble ever since. It has been implicated in multiple failed predictions about the return of Jesus and the end of the world from the Middle Ages down to our current time. It was behind the American Millerite movement's failed prediction of the return of Jesus in 1844, the Seventh-day Adventist subsequent software patch on that bit of theology, and that church has gone on to have a weak spot for revelation, which was behind the disaster of the Branch Davidians at Waco. The potted version of Revelation is that it is a prediction of the imminent destruction of the Roman Empire and the forces of evil that support it by God. It's full of death and destruction with diseases, lakes of fire, a widespread flood of blood, thunder, lightning, 100 pound hailstones, dragons, beasts and angels. It's organised into four sevens. It starts with the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor dictated by Jesus. Then Jesus is introduced as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, but he turns out to be a lamb who looks as though he has been killed. He opens seven seals that bring down various catastrophes. Then we have seven angels with trumpets who sound them in turn, each one bringing down more catastrophes. Then seven bowls of the wrath of God are poured out on the earth, with similar results. There are interludes to show the benefits given to the faithful, including the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. War in heaven, nefarious beasts associated with Rome, and, of course, this is early Christian writing after all, repeated references to demonic women and the sins of the flesh they commit with endless earthly rulers. Then the Battle of Armageddon is rather a disappointment. God just wins. There are no setbacks, triumphs over adversity, or even gruesome details of the fate of Satan and his minions. They just get tossed into a lake of fire. The New Jerusalem descends and the faithful live in utopia. The author, John of Patmos, is not writing about Christology. He is writing about God overthrowing Rome. But like other apocalyptic writers, he is not inventing heaven from nothing. He is starting from a common understanding of heaven shared by him and his readers and adapting it to his purpose. So we may find clues to his and his audience's understanding of heaven as well as his specific elaborations. Could Revelation help us with things like was Jesus going to return to earth or come for the first time? Was he born of a woman on earth or born of a woman in heaven? 
Was he crucified by Pilate in Judea or by evil demons in outer space? It does mention these things, but it says nothing of Jesus' sibship. In chapter 1, verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all people on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be, amen. All translations except one have him coming with clouds, that one being the New English translation, which has it as returning. Both the Sinai and Vatican codices have it as coming, so for what it's worth, Revelation does not indicate a prior earthly visit by Jesus. Then there is the reference to every eye shall see him, including those who pierced him. We can't infer that this means John believed Christ had previously been on earth, as it is a reference to Hosea, in which God takes vengeance on those who pierced him. Ambiguity of the vision, which includes both heavenly and earthly scenes, does not allow to us to include that he was referring to earthly executioners of an earthly person. Chapter 11 contains Revelation's only mention of crucifixion. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and was told, Come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant to my two witnesses authority to prophesy for one thousand two hundred sixty days, wearing sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will wage war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and the languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb and the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and exchange presents because these two prophets tormented the inhabitants of the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered the two witnesses and they stood on their feet, and those who saw them were terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here, and they went up into heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Clearly it's important to historicists that the great city, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, means earthly Jerusalem. The beginning of the chapter mentions the temple measurements, suggesting it was Jerusalem, but at this point in the vision, John is watching events from heaven. He is told to come and measure the temple, not to descend to earth and measure the temple. Revelation mentions a temple nine times, and all other mentions are clearly to heavenly temples. A number of scholarly papers have been written about this verse, but they don't help us much for two reasons. Firstly, most assume that Revelation was written in the 90s when Jerusalem had been destroyed. So the non-existence of Jerusalem is the main argument against the verse referring to it. Secondly, the authors were all historicists and didn't pause to consider a possible mythicist explanation. So I'll go no further than that. To me, it's ambiguous and invites further research. Chapter 12 has a possible clue about Paul's born of a woman statement. Then a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and screaming in labour pain, struggling to give birth. A huge red dragon that had seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven diadem crowns. Now the dragon's tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour the child as soon as it was born. So the woman gave birth to a son, a male child, who is going to rule over all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was suddenly caught up to God and to his throne. 
and she fled into the wilderness where a place had been prepared for her by God so she could be taken care of for 1,260 days. This is unambiguous. Jesus is being born to a significant woman in heaven, usually interpreted nowadays as Mary. We know from more modern examples of apocalyptic visionaries such as the Adventist Ellen G. White that they don't make up their heavenly scenes from scratch, but rather use their theological understanding as a basis on which to elaborate. This raises the possibility that this image of the heavenly birth of Jesus was part of John's theology. If so, and that theology was shared by Paul, then it helps us in two ways. Firstly, it clarifies that Paul's Galatian statement of born of a woman was born in heaven of a woman. Secondly, it also explains Paul's strange use of words. To introduce somebody as being born of a woman when everybody else was born of a woman is redundant and consequently nobody ever does it. The only other place in the Bible where born of a woman is used in this way is in Job and he uses it twice to describe humans in general rather than one in particular. Job 14.1, man born of woman lives but a few days. And Job 25.4, how can one born of a woman be pure? If this was a mythicist pericope, understood by John, Paul and their audience, then not only does it clarify Paul's meaning, but it also explains his use of words and why he used the term genomenos, which means something like created by God, rather than genos, meaning born. Neither of the two competing theories of historicity and mythicism predict that we will find any overtly mythicist references in the New Testament, because both agree that it was finalised centuries later during a period of historicist hegemony. The most mythicist content we can expect is failure to make overtly historicist comments and ambiguous references. As with Paul, we have no overtly historicist comments and a small number of ambiguous pointers. The distinction between coming and returning is hardly decisive, and the location of the crucifixion can be argued either way. The born of a woman pericope does strengthen the argument that Paul was referring to a spiritual birth of Jesus in Galatians. Overall, I would say that Revelation does favour mythicism, but that is somewhat dependent on my position on dating being accepted, and mine is a minority view.